Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Just so you know, you're in the session of professional video tips and tricks on a shoestring budget. Make sure you're in the right place. Um, before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping um, issues that we need to take care of. Uh, we ask that you make sure all of your electronic devices are on silent mode during the presentation today. Um, the session is being captured for use on the StaffWorks website and will be available on the conference website by mid-December. All the posters from today's conference will also be available on the website. And as a reminder, there will be a conference uh, evaluation sent to you electronically today following the last session of the conference. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. This is Mike Stork, and he's a media consultant with ITS. Thanks, Susan. Welcome, everyone. Um, professional video tips and tricks on a shoestring budget. Um, different shoestrings cost more than other ones, so <laughs> we're going to go through a lot of stuff. I want you guys to ask questions, but that being said, I'm going to cover so much, and it's going to have to be a little bit high level. I'm gonna, this is a Google presentation, which is going to be shared with everyone um, as is, and then I'll add things to it. So a lot of these links are clickable, and I'm not going to click and drill down into them. Um, so let's get started. Feel free to ask questions throughout, and I'll, I'll try to leave some time at the end for questions. Um, what we're going to cover today is a lot. So um, lighting. So basically, we need to, as a video professional, we need to be a, a professional photographer these days, which is uh, pretty difficult. But I'll show you the difference in that, and then. So that deals with lighting, the cameras, shot composition, tripods, and sound. Um, I'm going to cover some iPhone dro droid uh, and some cheaper handheld cameras, and then publishing, streaming, and story. <clears throat> so uh, I probably should start here, because exposure and lighting is your most important part of any shot. Um, and the biggest mistake you can make is to use your flash and have it do the opposite of what you thought it was going to do. So I grabbed these poor people off the internet. Um, so this gentleman up here has taken a picture probably for his Facebook page or something. But you can see that there's a flash that was used. And it's, it's doing exactly the opposite of what you think a flash would do. So it lit behind him, which made his face completely dark. So actually, it would have been better off to turn the flash off and take the picture and it had good lighting with just natural room lighting. Um, another problem with this is the background is white and we can't really see his shoulder. So there's no, it's kind of a floating head type thing. Um, you can see this picture down at the bottom. It has a dark background. And even though the gentleman's wearing dark clothing, his shoulder's been established. And they've done that with uh, different lights. They went for an effect on his face when they're not illuminating his whole face, which you can be done. But um, if they wanted to, his whole face could have looked nicely lit like that. And he would have been <clears throat> separated from the background. So as some bullets here, um, if you're going to take a picture or a video, um, don't make sure that the windows are behind. So backlight. Um, a lot of people say, oh, that, that window scene looks great out of Palmer Commons looking over the field. But really, it's just a sea of light. So you're not going to see anything that you want in the foreground of your picture. So when I go to shoots, I have to do a lot of things and show up in somebody's office and take a video or a picture. And <clears throat> I have to deal with. I usually close all their blinds or I put some kind of diffusion <coughs> to get natural light down or I'll shoot them against their uh, the bookshelf or I try to get some depth of field, which we'll talk about soon. But um, Your first inclination was probably to have a lot of light behind the subject and that's a no-no. So if I'm outdoors, which I try to, try to shoot outdoors all the time, except for in the winter, um, I've run into things where, oh, it looks great, but it's really lit, like, say, <coughs> right in the middle of campus by the cube. Uh, you know, there's like a ton of light behind the subject, and I, you get the same effect. 
So I really have to set up and shoot into the shadows of the trees with the light coming to the side. Um, this is an art, and it takes a lot of practice, but if you could just get avoid this, you, you're 50% there. So, um, also, if you're outside, the sun's shining down. You really want the sun to be shining towards your camera instead of at your subject. One, because they'll squint. But two, um, direct sunlight is not good either. So, um, because we work 9 to 5 or you know, 7.30 to 8.30 at night for some of you, no. um, it's the best time to shoot is in the early morning or at 7 p.m. And often I, I don't have that luxury. So I have to meet people at, uh, you know, much time and shoot and it's it, the sun is just beating down so often i'm looking for a partially shaded area and then i reflect light back up or i take a light even outside and just to illuminate their face uh, some other bullets on here i uh, i mentioned the dark background so dark blue you know u of m blue is great uh black works and uh, i use uh black sheet that I got at a garage sale a lot. So um, blue uh, fleece blankets are awesome because they absorb light. They don't reflect anything. And I use straight up duct tape and duct tape it to the wall and behind your subject and it looks great. As long as the blanket doesn't fall down, which <laughs> make sure you use really sticky tape. And ask your facilities people before because you might rip the paint off the wall. So um, that's a trick, though. And if you have a little bit of money, you can get a frame and do this. And a lot of people don't want me doing that because they want it to look natural and quick. So I just say, well, then, you know, let's let's redirect your laptop camera away from the window behind you. And I'll also get into um, everything's white wall, white brick walls and beige walls everywhere I go. And oh, it looks horrible. Um, especially with lighter skinned people. Um, so I try not to shoot against a light wall like that and uh, try to get some things in the background and we'll go over that. But um, there's something called the color wheel if you want to Google that. Uh, you can see that um, green and orange looks best behind light skinned people and dark skinned people for that matter. Um, but if you look at the color wheel and you're interested, you can see that there there's opposite colors that bode well together. I'm not an interior designer, but I definitely know which ones don't look good together. So <clears throat> that's a good way to uh, make sure that people aren't looking sickly. So if you have green behind them, but you don't want fluorescent green reflecting on their face, because then they're going to look a little ill. So it's, as I said, it's kind of an art, but with a little bit of practice, you can get it right. So, and I'm going to go back here. I'm going to click through some of these slides rather quickly because I'm going to provide these to you that have links. So um, I've included some equipment that, even though it costs a little bit, uh, it will really be worth buying. So this is a reflector here, and that's what I would take outside to redirect the sun um, in order to illuminate their face a little bit more. And then these are different lights. This is what's called a soft box. And it's actually a tungsten light, um, but that soft cover makes it so your subject matter isn't squinting. But I use these a lot, right up in their face, off of camera, and then you get a nice illumination of their face. The LED technology is uh, utilized nowadays, and this is an LED light. <clears throat> it is a different color, so in layman's terms, an LED light would look a little blue. Uh, a tungsten light or an incandescent light, which is a real light bulb, would look a little bit yellow. And sometimes that's a good thing. Um, natural lighting, by the way, has a little bit of a blue hue to it. So um, you want to try to get them looking good, um, whether it, it's blue or not. So if you watch NYPD Blue, the TV show, they shoot everything blue because it's supposed to be cold and you know, creepy looking, um, but if I shot Tim Slotto in his office, I, I probably wouldn't want this cold, you know, look. So I, I make it look a little yellow, and it warms it up a little bit. But that being said, I'm always 
mixing natural light with the other. And you can do some of this in post-production or in your uh, computer programs, but you should never be planning to do things in your computer programs. Those settings are just for when you did something wrong in the shoot, you know. I'm sure some of you have some Photoshop experience, and you can do a lot, but who has time to touch up their photos for hours and hours? So if you get it right the first time, uh, you can use it right away. This is another uh, tungsten light down here. So um, these lights, you can, you can use one light if that's all you have. Uh, but you probably want two or three. If you have two lights, you'll set one up as your key light close to the subject, and your other one will kind of soften the face so we don't get this, this hard fall off right here. So this is, that shadow is created. If, we had, if they put another light right there, then we would have seen a more balanced um, lit face there. Let me know if you have any questions throughout here. Um, so I'll provide you with more, I'll provide you with some links of where to buy some of this stuff, and you can also Google from these keywords to get more information. So shot, shot composition is so important too. I mentioned the gentleman that was standing right in front of the beige wall, and um, even up here if we took a picture, I would want uh, what's called depth of field. So instead of taking a picture of me standing right against the wall, I'd take a picture of me standing in front of all the views. And they could either be in focus or not in focus. You obviously want your subject matter in focus. But this is a nice depth of field. So we have rolling hills going back there. And um, this other picture of Scarlett Johansson, they've used um, more of a still camera with lens, it puts the background a little bit out of focus, which is nice. But most HD video cameras do not do that. So um, if I shot this with a cheap HD camera, everything would be in focus, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because it's still going to look good. But um, if I used a more expensive camera with a lens, it would put all of this out of focus. And I also could do this in Final Cut or Photoshop, but you kind of see an edge because I'd have to make that blurry. But that, that's a technique too, and you can see in both of these, there's, it's no, um, they're out here with the green behind their heads because it just always looks good, so that's no accident either. Some other uh, Things. I'm always grabbing the, the plant from down the hall, which really upsets people sometimes when I move their plant. Um, so always ask first. But, um, yeah, I'm always putting a little plant or a fern next to them um, just because there's so much beige and white throughout the university. Um, flowers are great. Um, you may want to make sure you're getting the flowers from the right season. So I learned that too, that you know, it's autumn, maybe you want to use autumn flowers. Um, pictures on the wall, you might think that, that that's great to use, but often they're too big. It's like you'll, you'll frame your shot, and actually a picture that looked huge on the wall is now going to take up a little tiny spot, and that might not look good at all, the way you framed it. So um, look for small pictures or small things just to add a little color if you're stuck in a beige office. Um, also, you may think... Try not to have your subject matter be directly in the middle of the frame. It's nice to have them a little bit offset. And um, with this one, they did it because they had three people. But uh, it's nice to have like a third over either side. And then if you have to cut some video together, uh, it gets a nice juxtaposition. Um, sometimes you use people right in the middle. Of it, but um, try to put them a little bit to the side. Um, and also, I do a lot of work to set my tripod lower to make people look taller. Um, with that being said, you don't want to shoot up their nostrils, though, because... And if you're using a webcam, you always get that angle. So I actually put... I carry around some... Uh, you can even use books, but uh, so often if you're helping somebody or you're doing a web cast, uh, get your laptop up a little bit. It's not very good for carpal tunnel, but then you won't be shooting your nostrils up. And so, um, 
Make yourself look big and uh, tall, but don't get that uh, Citizen Kane. If anybody knows that movie, they shot everything like way below, so Orson Welles looked like he was 10 feet tall. So, let me know if you have any questions. I said this is going to be a lot, but hopefully we can get through the theory. And Go ahead. If you're shooting uh, a video, uh, you know, asking someone questions off camera, should they still be one third off center, or what's, what's the best? Great question. He asked about it like in, a, in an interview. So I, I do a lot of interviews where I have them look at the uh, that person interviewing them, so it's slightly off camera, and that's a good technique, and it also puts people at ease when they're talking to a person instead of the cold camera hide. And um, I often still try to have them a little bit off because I like to have that fern or that, you know, something of interest to the side. Um, and if I'm shooting them, if they are in the middle of the frame, you want to make sure that maybe you can get some a winding hole <laughs> behind them, you know, so that, because um, it just, it, this looks really flat. If you have somebody right in the middle, and there's not much stuff behind them, then, um, so sometimes I'll set them up, and then six feet behind them to the side will be the plan. You know, so it's like, it's not right next to them, it's way behind. And um, with leadership, or if I'm going for a different, um, if I know the person's at ease, and they need to be really addressing um, our audience, I'll have them look right in the camera, and I can have other people looking at slightly to the side. Is that kind of what you're looking for? But ultimately, it's up to you. You know, you can uh, you can decide either way. But um, you'll see when you cut things together, if everybody's right in the middle, um, it's kind of it gets boring after a while. Like, so if you have them like a little bit, this, maybe you start with somebody looking right in the camera, then you have an interview. This person's looking this way and then cut over the side. It's like a natural break. And uh, subconsciously, it gives the viewer something interesting. And they may not start checking their email after a minute and a half, you know, watch your whole three minute video. Which is another thing. Keep these things short because people's attention spans are like a minute and a half now. Um, and it, it's hard for me to get. People, because it's all good information, you know, but you got to cut, 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 keep it under five minutes. Great questions. Keep them home. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to try to go quickly through the gear because um, this is all stuff you can look up. And uh, we just purchased some Canon 5D Mark III's, which is this large camera over there, and it's a, a professional steel camera that does video. It does up to 27 minutes of video unless you do some... Um, software adjustments, but you'll see me shooting with that in the main room if you want to stop by. I also shot before I, we bought this with the Canon of Kodak ZI8, so it's just basically Kodak's version of a flip camera, the size of a cell phone, and it does great video. You know, there's, you can't zoom, but you can zoom with it, but you probably shouldn't. So you, you always try to keep that close to your subject and just let it roll and go with it. And it, it looks great. Um, you can see that the Canon it deals with lenses, and I'll cover some of those. But these other cameras don't necessarily have lenses on them, even though they have a little bit of zoom qualities. <laughs> Down here's a GoPro, and these are amazing. They're about $400. And this is the new one, the Hero 3 Plus. And it's waterproof, has a waterproof housing. And you can even stream and control with Wi-Fi. So that's $300. And these are getting really famous, or already are famous, because they're just small and you can clip them anywhere. Yeah. So those have really come down in price, and they look great. Uh, HD video cameras, a traditional large camera. Uh, you just you want to get a camera that's maybe it starts, stores on a media card, so we don't really, we're past the tape-based systems. Um, and there's a lot of those on the market. Always use a tripod. Um, no matter what, if you think you can hold your camera steady, you probably should be using a tripod. So um, here's a couple tripods you could buy. I, I, 
included a picture of this uh, gorilla pod. There's these bendable uh, tripods that work well. But they also shake. So if I put a tripod on a table, that table is going to shake. So um, that's another reason to use your tripod and put it on the ground and don't let it be touching a table that your subject matter might be wiggling um, because you know the, the more solid, the less shake you have in your shot, the more professional it's going to look. Now, if you're shooting a TV series or something, they include some of the shake to add you know, intensity, but we're not doing that, I don't think. Um, and look out for garage sales. I use really uh, cheap old tripods that I buy in garage sales just in a pinch. My wife makes fun of me for having stuff in my trunk all the time, but I use it. <coughs> Sound is so important. Um, there's no onboard camera mic or laptop mic that really does sound quality that I think is acceptable. Um, you're going to get the, the wind of the room, the air conditioning, the projectors, fan, um, the jostling of chip bags or, you know, people's fidgeting around. So you, it's so important to close mic somebody. Um, this is a lava leader or a clip-on microphone that we've seen at some of these uh, conference rooms and things. Those are great. This particular one I like because it's battery powered on both the receiver and the transmitter, um, which makes you very mobile. The shotgun microphone is up top. It's a long skinny one, and that is what's put on a fish pole, they call it. It's a long aluminum pole, and you, you've seen the guys in the, holding the audio off camera. Um, that's a shotgun. That does a great job. But I honestly, I just bought a shotgun, and I've been shooting for years with just putting a lavalier in there. Um, you got to look out for wind, and I'll cover that a little bit. Um, there's ways of doing that, and I'll, sometimes I'll hide the microphone kind of inside their clothing and hope they don't jostle around too much. Um, and you can get some really good audio. <clears throat> and I'm always paranoid, so I have a bunch of backup plans. I record multiple audio tracks from different angles and things, um, and then hopefully one of them will turn out. Um, this other one's a mini shotgun that you can put on top of your camera. It has what's called a shoe on it, and you can plug that in to uh, your camera. So this is what the shoe mount would be, and you, even though this camera has a microphone on it, it's what's called omnidirectional, so it would pick me up talking behind it. So I'll plug a shotgun on there, plug it in the side, and I could yell at it from behind the camera and it wouldn't pick up me. It would just pick up uni unidirectional, what's in front only. This little device down here is great because I don't have to carry an extra laptop around. Um, it's a handheld recording device. And uh, it has microphones on it too, but it also has multiple inputs that I could plug in any and all these other microphones to get great audio. And often if you have great audio, uh, you can get away with pretty crappy video. <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, if the audio is great, maybe you don't have to reshoot, you know, because nobody has time to reshoot. So get it right the first time, carry a bunch of stuff around like I do, and have backup plans. Um, mixer, uh, uh, you may, mixer is just another thing to carry around, but a mixer you can get pretty cheap. It just adds different sources, so you can have more than one microphone plugging in, and then mix it down and have options. Let me know if anybody has any questions. Oh, I'm going to have time to, okay. So, a little bit more about sound. Um, this is a little, the technical term is muff, and that covers a shotgun microphone. So, wind is really a problem when you're outside, and this little device will almost eliminate it within reason. Um, you can get the muff cover for a shotgun microphone for that Zoom microphone we saw, and for little clip-on microphones. So, I recommend spending 25 bucks for one of those. Um, we talked about air ducts and projector noise. Uh, don't place your mics on the tables, and if I do, I put a little piece of foam under them because they'll pick up thuds, which will make your audio unusable. Um, 
I never let my subjects be in swivel chairs because they'll fidget. They don't even know they're doing it. If you do have them in it, uh, try to make them aware of it or try to lock it down a little bit. Or squeaky chairs. Sometimes people cross their legs and they'll squeak their shoes together. So it's good to be aware of all the things that you know could affect your audio track. <clears throat> um, sound diffusion. So even like I mentioned the duct tape thing with the background, but with uh, blankets, the fleece blankets, or um, even paper, like you can redirect the wind from HVAC. You don't want to cover it up all the way because that's going to pump right through it. But sometimes I just put, um, I rip off a piece of white flip chart and tape it up there, and now the wind is going that way instead of this way where my microphone is. Um, there's baffles, that's what that essentially is. Foam, and then soundproofing foam if you really want to get professional. But any kind of foam has some soundproofing, and sometimes I'll put just pieces of <coughs> foam around the person in the, that's doing voiceover work because um, it's called a mic booth. They have one at the Duderstadt Center if you want to use it. It's free. If you can take your subject up there or yourself to go do your voiceover, do that. If you can't, um, you can do kind of a poor man's version and just surround, make, find a quiet room, surround it with some foam, or just make sure you're not right next to concrete because concrete reflects just like a billiards table. Like that sounds going and going. So um, even in here, you know, this is wallpaper that has some sound deflection. So the ceiling tiles are making this room less live. So uh, Google that if you want to learn more about the physics of sound. I mentioned lenses. Um, these are all the lenses. Some of the lenses I have for the Canon 5D Mark III. Basically, this one's very short, but it does great still pictures. Um, telephoto lens gives you the zoom from the back of the conference room. Um, wide angle, so we do a lot of cube shots, so if you have to have the camera right in front of the person, you need to go wide angle. And you could also you know, get more of that beautiful scenic shot with a wide angle. And this last one over here is a fisheye lens, which distorts the outer edges. Um, not really used in business, but they look really cool if you're going for that effect. So iPhones and droids have come a long way. Um, here's a picture of a clip-on adjustment. They make all these different clip-on adjustments. So this is a wide-angle lens put on just a normal iPhone. This is the 5.4S. It does a good job with video. Um, the 5 does an even better job, but um, this is acceptable for a lot of things. Uh, the biggest problem is you're shaking, so maybe you want to cradle it and just keep it really steady. Um, they also make clip-on adjustments for tripods. So I would recommend getting that and you're using something you already have in your pocket. <coughs> Um, there's also apps that allow you now to stream live video with your iPhone, and I've uh, given you some links here. But you can look on the internet and see there's just wonderful things, photographers, you know, canoeing and streaming it to a gal that is a quadriplegic. So she's tuning into this photographer's site and able to go to places that were never possible before this. And, it's amazing how um, the satellite capability and the bandwidth that we can push through is it's here now. Um, I mentioned the GoPro. If you spent $400 on that, um, that camera before it could be waterproof, and that streams too. So there was uh, some kid put it on a, a, a weather balloon with a robot part of it, and the robot like went pretty much space before the balloon. And it recorded all of it. It was just amazing. So there was just a 60 minutes um, special on the inventor of the GoPro, and all the footage they included was just amazing, all done by amateurs. So check that out. If you're using an iPhone, what's the best way to get the best 
So she asked about uh, sound for iPhone for video. So um, your iPhone has an input on it, so you could plug in any of those microphones I showed you into your iPhone. It's going to make it a little clunkier, but um, I would just recommend you don't use the microphone on the iPhone because it's going to pick up behind it as much as in front of it. So one thing you could do is take a piece of foam or tape and you know make sure that the microphones that aren't going that way, the mics are on the bottom for one. So you could redirect some of the sound going this way. We'll plug an optional microphone in the top. So there's, if you Google that or if you want to ask me more about that, but this is an input, so that could be any microphone. The problem with the sound is that it's picking up everywhere around it because um, it's an omnidirectional microphone. There's two of them on the bottom right there. So be aware of that. So if I put a huge piece of foam taped onto the back of this and curved it out, it would actually stop picking up behind it because I'm muffling everything behind it. So that could improve it. And just make sure you have it, have it as close to your subject as possible um, within reason because uh, you still have to have the video frame correct. But the closer it is to your subject and if the microphone is pointing at the subject, it's going to pick up more of them than the rest. Then you might want to try to you know, do it in a quiet area. So if you're at the mall, you're going to get lots of room noise. You know, so maybe try to find a quiet room. Anybody else have questions? So, uh, publishing, streaming, and storing. So you've shot the script footage, and now what are you going to do with it? Um, we mentioned a little bit about streaming on the handheld devices, but um, if a lot of times maybe if you don't need to stream live, maybe you can just capture it and make it available later. So. We have my video here at U of M. Um, it's basically a branded uh, YouTube-like experience. So we can um, we can put video on the back end is Caltura is the brand name, but they're a uh, well-known company that's been in the game for sports and news for years. And uh, contact my video if you have some uh, if you'd like to use that service. It's uh, relatively inexpensive, and you can get a branded YouTube experience. So this is the way to get your departmental stuff up without having these YouTube suggestions that may or may not be appropriate next to it. Um, maybe you want something public, but not so public that people from around the globe are tuning into it. Well, you can look into my video, and they'll uh, consult you and see what you need to get using that service. Um, I still use YouTube from time to time, um, usually because we want people to go to a YouTube channel for ITS external communications or BNF. Um, if you, uh, you used to only get 15 minutes, but you can do over 15 minutes if you uh, verify your account. So you, um, I still try to keep things short and manageable. I'll break up long conferences. Uh, but YouTube can store, and you can embed that in a different site if you want to drive people through your website. Um, but you can also stream with the Google Hangouts on Air broadcast feature, which is nice. But it is going to the public, so uh, anybody can watch my wonderfully exciting uh, business-related things. <laughs> <laughs> My one manager is like, you mean everybody sees this? I'm like, I don't think it's not a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I've got a number of, of short videos on YouTube, and we have the option to make it public, private, or unlisted. Yes. The public, the world gets to see it. Right. Private, only people who you have actually given the link to or put on a, a private list and unlisted, <coughs> only people who, who have the, the link can do it. So we're right. sharing it. We, put, we typically put it on unlisted so you can send it to somebody, but anybody searching you know, from the world can't find it. Right. Good point. She mentioned that there's three settings on YouTube. It's public, unlisted, or private. So just about everything I put unlisted, and people just they can find it if they have the link. Um, 
you might not want to put like HIPAA or FERPA data on there because that would be a bad thing. Um, private is private, but then everybody has to have your YouTube login, which isn't good because then they're going to go behind the scenes and move all the stuff around possibly. Um, but there are some settings to keep it a little bit less public, but that option doesn't default when you're broadcasting a hangout. So when you broadcast a hangout, you can't say you do it on listed or private. It's public. And when I hit stop recording, I quickly go in to YouTube and try to make it not public. So that's something to be aware of uh, until further notice. They, the setting that they thought would work doesn't work at this time. So um, if you're talking live streaming, um, just be aware. Does the my video have closed captioning? Um, Good question. Um, she asked, does my video have closed caption capabilities? And it does, but it doesn't auto-caption. So um, right now, the fastest way for us to get something captioned is to put it up on YouTube, auto-caption it, fix the captions. Um, if I need it over my video, I then download the fixed captions and upload them in my video. Seems like an extra step, because it is. Um, but um, that's fast. I also have um, a transcription USB machine with this software called Express Drive that we have students, um, if they're willing, to transcribe stuff. Um, and that's a hands-free thing, like, a, like you're a court stenographer. Uh, you can pause, fast forward, rewind with your feet, and type pointing fast. Um, there are also third-party caption solutions like Caption Colorado, which are really expensive and not ideal at this time. So um, we're trying to get better, but um, right now it does take a lot of time and resources to get things to be uh, released as quick as you know you want to and be accessible. But yeah, if you have any questions about that, we uh, Jane Vincent and uh, Scott Williams are um, accessibility people uh, that work for ITS before the university also, and I can also pass on some resources on that. Uh, I want to mention MBOX, because um, you have 50 gigs of, for your personal M plus box, which is great because video is huge, but you can get a ton of video into your 50 gig personal space. It takes a while to upload, but once it's up there, you can share it with people, kind of like we mentioned with the different settings. YouTube box has some of those settings. Uh, you could share some of your draft stuff. Um, you may not want it on YouTube yet. So share the drafts on Box, get people to type in the comments and send you some edits, and then get your version back, and maybe then you put it on my video or YouTube. Question? We are, we are changing a lot of video with Videographer. Uh, that provider sometimes hard drive with a raw footage. Do you think that MBOX with the 200 gig is a good way to, to direct them, or they just do well, that right because the speed of downloading and not really right. is, a, is an issue? So, excellent question, Rajesh. Um, so, we st I still want everything to be on um, my not local drive or my external hard drive or a shared drive for speed. And then when I get um, a draft version or what I think is a final version for edits, and then I'll put it up somewhere because uh, MBox is great, but still, you know, I can't be sitting there waiting two and a half hours to get a 10 minute video up. You know, I'll do that before I leave at night, you know. Um, but it, it's exciting because they just upped the 50 gig. You can, you can request through For Help um, a group account that gives you 200 gigs. So um, just another tool to use, but not, um, don't use this instead of your local stuff. And I'll get into more of that with the next slide here. Great questions. Go ahead. Just another question on inbox. On, on the, the health system side, you don't use it very much, maybe not at all. I don't know. How compared to, say, using YouTube to share, it's like, here, I want you to see the video that we just did, send you to the link in the email. How hard is it if I wanted them to, to if I did inbox instead? How, so, how, hard uh, how hard is it to use Inbox instead of YouTube? Um, I still use both. So one I like because I can get my file up to YouTube quicker. But if I think that I could have the chance of accidentally sharing it, I, you know, 
uh, and I don't put it up to YouTube. So I don't want something that some leadership information that's not supposed to be released yet in draft version on YouTube. So that's cool with Mbox, more secure. Um, does take so I use both of them still. Mbox also is very nice because it replaces the version that you had there, and I believe it's the same link. I might be misspeaking though, but when you do different versions in YouTube, it's always a different link. And also, YouTube will recognize if it's almost exactly the same. Sometimes it won't let you upload it because it says you are this is a duplicate, which is extremely annoying when I hit upload before I went home tonight and go in the next morning and see that I don't have a version. Um, so Mbox will do that, but you have to do some massaging with Mbox to get um, those versions right too. So it, it leaves the comments from version two and puts version three in place of it. And then I skip forward and say, oh, those edits have been, you know, implicated, so i got to delete some things. So, go ahead. Can I share it just as easily as a link? Yes. Email? Yeah. Okay. You can do settings um, for collaborators, uh, U of M, or just open, and then you can share that link. So it's, it's a URL. Go ahead in the front there. I just want to be clear. So at the house, um, uh, one of the programs I work with, they there to do a lot of internal training using video. And we had talked initially, um, we did something called, um, oh gosh, bring something up. It was a, a video thing that we did and we tried, and they used regular, uh, yeah, just slap it in the eyes. Um, these regular cameras. And they're no longer doing that, but when we were talking about Kaltura and the work that they were doing with the university, there were some of the HIPAA issues. Uh, things that we couldn't share would not necessarily be used for patient information, but for internal training of physicians, that kind of thing, process for the department. So which of these would be for the safest environment for somebody to work within? I would say my video, Caltura, but did they, and they're working with Sal and some of our security team about, um, is it, it, it's secure, okay. and but we, we're going to hold their feet to the fire and make sure that it is before we're putting heavy information up there. Um, so um, you can share it with Mbox, but I mean, I don't know if the health system wants to use Mbox, but um, that's something that you have to make sure you have clearance on if you're going to use that personal privacy information. Um, but I would say, I mean, my video it was purchased and it's offered as a solution because we didn't want somebody else controlling our content. Um, so that if it's not there yet, there there's people working on it. Did you have a question in the back? Yeah, uh, I'd say actually I would suggest that you use Unbox, the health system, but it depends on what you use it for. It okay. really extends yourself, but we actually use it for a project, you know, a media project. Mm -hmm. So we use it a lot, a lot of our projects in this platform. But again, you know, you've got to get into the level of one with your Yes. So I would I would strongly suggest don't, if it's a gap, don't put it out YouTube, like don't, don't right. go that way, just stick it in the Unbox. Okay. But just like anything you've got to organize. Right. You know, you know, whatever tool you use, with all of this, this is fantastic. But you know, I still have to do that house because which is very right. intensive, but you have to do it. But it's a really nice tool, and you can speak to this involvement in that. One thing I found was uh, I have clients who put videos into PowerPoint so they can get them. And then if you stick it out on Mbox, you could download everything, but then you have to be really creative. So that's just something to keep in mind. Really yeah, realize. with all these tools, there's still some housekeeping, but that's somebody that's from the health system that's using Mbox. So, um, yeah, get the 200 gigs, just realize that it's going to take longer to upload, and people may have to uh, have it render on their machine, but they can watch it right in a box. They don't have to download it. Go ahead. The other thing is YouTube has, of course, their, their video editor, which you can add graphics and all that stuff. Right. Does Mbox have anything like that? No, no. She asked about YouTube's video editor. Um, you can't edit video in Mbox at this time. They they're working on editing editing features, which now you can edit like a Word doc. Um, you can't, but also be careful with YouTube's editing features because when you edit, they have the right to put uh, ads pop up inside your video after that. So um, I don't do heads and tails editing. And I try not to use it at all unless I have to because it's usually appropriate um, uh, ads, but still, you know, I don't want even their ad in my 
Michigan State. <laughs> right? <It could. laughs> Great questions there, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep going. The storage, uh, we're almost done here. Like I said, this is a lot, so keep the questions coming. Um, you're going to see me next door streaming the leadership panel, but I'm going to be streaming with an old camera that's standard definition video. Uh, because really, there's no need to stream HD video because the people watching it are going to have breakup problems, buffering problems. Um, so if you do all these things that we covered with good lighting, good camera placement, good audio, standard definition video is great if you have to stream it. Um, I'm going to have a $5,000 camera right next to it capturing it in higher resolution that we'll edit and put up. But um, for streaming, we're still in this in-between area where um, the new cameras that come out don't have FireWire outputs, and some of the USB ports don't do video. They're actually just for moving data. So I'm going to be updating this camera recommendation for streaming, but I was very frustrated because I have to recommend a camera that I use that is not commercially available right now. Where did I get mine? The Duderstadt Center gave me two of them when they were sending them to Dispo. But they happened to have a FireWire input on them. FireWire's a cable that I'll cover here next. But um, I use a camera that's old and has a tape on it, but I don't use the tape. I just use the, the output of the camera to go FireWire into, I have an adapter on my PC, or I have an adapter for any Mac, and it recognizes it. Um, well, compassing tools will not recognize an HD signal. So if I have this great HD camera, it's you know even made in the back of the conference room, I still can't tap into it because it's too high of a resolution of video and different frame rate. So can't get into that too much more, but I just wanted you to be aware of it. So I've these two cameras are not uh, their standard definition. This is kind of like a robotic camera that has a composite video out. And I have included down here some ways of getting composite video. Composite is just your old VCR video in, um, audio to left and right. So here's some different cables. This is what I mentioned. Um, here's a FireWire 400 cable. And this is the mini version. So this plugs into my camera. This comes out, and I have a card on my laptop PC that goes in like that. If I'm going into a Mac, I need to have an 800 because they stopped including this port on laptops. So I have to have an adapter that goes from here to here. So I go out of the camera here, adapt it from there, and go into the Mac with that one. Eventually, they always have been saying for a couple of years that Thunderbolt is the future. The only place I've seen the Thunderbolt is on iPhone 5s and tablets, um, so we're not quite there yet. They don't really even make computers that have a Thunderbolt, um, at least not ones that we get here at U of M yet. There probably is an instance, but Thunderbolt's not here yet is the point. If you uh, want to read more about it, I have a link there, and, or just Google it. Um, I mentioned I have a capture card in a desktop PC, which takes up uh, a slot in the back of it. I use an Osprey one that I've included there. Black Magic also makes one. And you can take that standard video, and uh, it has an adapter on the back <coughs> that I can just plug in standard composite video. Um, and it works great for streaming. Um, the laptop card adapter I have is kind of an old technology, too, but my PC, uh, laptop PC has a slot that I plug it in, and then I have three FireWire 400 inputs, and that's what I'll be using next door for the 1 o'clock meeting. Um, there's an audio AV bridge. It's a great piece of gear. There's a lot of these USB uh, dongle-type conversions that go into your computer crash. Um, so while they work sometimes, they're not that stable. The audio AV bridge is around $1,700, and that we had included in one of our conference rooms in order to get a USB output from the wall that gives me audio and uh, standard definition video. Unfortunately, it won't. It, try, it can also pass HD video, but not something that the, the software on the computer can recognize. So, 
Um, let's start that conversation. So there's a lot of frustration there because it's hard to find this stuff out, but we're in this in-between zone that um, makes streaming really, very difficult. I guess it's uh, job security for me. Um, <laughs> really quickly, because um, I'm running out of time here and I want to take some more questions, let me know if you have any. Um, there is a thing called a video switcher. Uh, so that I could do, once again, standard definition video. I could use two cameras, go into the switcher, and I get one output. Because I only can plug one camera into a computer to some of the software. So the video card on a laptop or a computer is usually one input. Um, but you can do, get a video switcher to make many inputs be, then feed one. So uh, an example is I have two of those Canon Vixia cameras that I said were older. I could take the standard definition output and go into the switcher and I have two cameras and then maybe I have a scan converter hooked up to a computer that is capturing the computer image. So now I have the ability to switch between two cameras and the computer. So it's essentially just with the scan converter would be in line of what you would do to help put to get to a projector. Now scan converters, while they give you the image, it's a slightly blurry image because you have to buy a really expensive one to have it be really good. And I'm talking standard definition video now because they have HD versions of all this, but now we're outside of, we're talking big bucks for an HD system, an HD video switcher, and an HD converter. And after you do all that, you're really not going to stream it because it's in HD. So, uh, not a good use of $50,000 today. Maybe, maybe a couple years from now it will be, but um, I don't have one yet. So, and that's why I do have an old switcher though that I still keep pulling out of retirement that um, works good for standard definition video. Here's also some usable scan converters that I said are just standard definition, but these are for three, four hundred bucks, you can get a, a computer image VGA to be composite video signal. Let me know if you have questions about that. Web conferencing tools, uh, ITS has Adobe Connect. The medical school has their own instance of Adobe Connect. Very great way to stream. Um, I just call it the screen is king because you can share the screen. It looks great. And the video is in the corner with audio, and um, if you have an ITS sponsored event, we can use that, or the medical school could give you an Adobe Connect license, or I can give you a vendor and you can purchase your own uh, online rooms for that. Uh, Google Plus Hangout, if you're in Google, um, you can have a Google Plus account, which then you can do a Hangout. You can broadcast that Hangout, which goes to more than you can have 15 people in the, the departmental hangout. Well, if you want, want more than that, you need to broadcast it, and they supposedly up to a million people can view that. Um, you also can sync that to your YouTube site, which then you could record. So that's all free, and with free comes frustration. <laughs> um, but it does work, and I have some, I've done two IT for you. Uh, webinars on it, and um, I'm willing to help out and give you some links on how you can do that. Now, I know the health system doesn't use Google as the U of M version, so you can do that with your personal Google account. Um, a handy feature with if you are using your personal account, you can add a teleconference telephone line to take up one of the seats in the Hangout, and now you have you know, traditional teleconference people piping in uh, with their audio. U of M's instance of that doesn't have that available right now, but uh, we're hoping that that'll be turned on soon. Let me know if you have any questions about that. BlueJeans is a great system that basically takes a lot of these different web conferencing tools and gives, makes them available within itself. And Oh, yeah, I'm pretty much going to be at time. I didn't realize we're, we're there. But uh, once again, I'll provide you with these slides. 
and uh, you get some ideas of how to compress and save things on a hard disk. And I appreciate it. Send me any questions you have. Uh, I'm willing to keep the discussion going. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here, and this is a gift from the staff. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.